Good afternoon and welcome to today's event. My name is Josh Patel, Chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce and Vice President of Commercial Financial Services at RBC. Before we start, on behalf of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to acknowledge we're gathered today on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional land of the Ojibwe Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene Nations, and the homeland of the Red River Métis. Did you know February is Indigenous Storytelling Month? Hearing the stories of our Indigenous people is one of the first steps to reconciliation. For more resources for your own journey to reconciliation, visit winnipeg-chamber.com slash TRR. Remember the feeling of gathering together, whether you're making connections at the chamber luncheon with thousand attendees, chanting True North at a Jets game, relaxing on the grass, listening to some great live music at Folk Fest, or even being with family and friends to share a meal together. We all miss the feeling of togetherness, but right now we're all still together, gathering virtually from the comfort of our home or office. Our team at the chamber quickly pivoted to virtual programming and events to keep our community connected. We knew the business community needed to stay connected to share best practices so they too can pivot. And oh wow, did our community pivot. This year we launched our Reimagine Winnipeg campaign which recognizes local entrepreneurs who've embraced the change force upon them to ultimately spark innovative business plans and achieve unexpected success. We hope to continue to tell your stories. This past year has been a year of growth and innovation for our community across all sectors include the event industry, who is now equipped to engage and offer events to anyone around the world at any time. Here at the Chamber, we've seen so many attendees from outside of Winnipeg taking our events live or on our website following a live event. We have pivoted, but now it's time to pivot again, back to a reality of in-person gatherings, but we've learned and grown since then. Today's event is to share these important lessons learned from event experts. With each passing day, more and more Winnipeggers are getting vaccinated and it sparks a sense of hope we can soon gather again soon. What do in-person events look like post-COVID? What future event safety precautions and logistics do we have to consider? Before we hear from some event experts in the field, I wanted to share how today's event will work. Today's virtual luncheon programming is set to reflect your usual in-person luncheon experience. This is your opportunity to connect with your community and other chamber members, all from your home or office. If you have any technical issues today, please contact any of our chamber staff by chat on the right hand side. They are listed as WCC help under the attendee list. We'd also like to thank our chamber champions and chamber leaders who have stepped up and helped the chamber providing events and supports to our members. Thank you for everything you do. We encourage you to get on social media and join in on the conversation using the hashtag WCCBiz. We encourage you to send in your questions via the chat. The panel will be answering some questions during the Q&A portion. Okay, let us get started. I'm extremely excited to be introducing to you our moderator today, who will be sharing his own events industry expertise, as well as facilitating a conversation with our two panelists. Jonathan Strauss is the president and founder of Strauss Event and Association Management a company he founded in 1995 at the age of 16. Jonathan's company manages several national and regional associations, as well as many large scale events, trade shows and conferences, both in person and virtual. Thank you for joining us today, Jonathan. I'll pass it off to you now to introduce your two panelists. Thanks Raj, I appreciate the introduction and thank you to the Winnipeg Chamber for the opportunity to collaborate on this session. Uh, it's great to uh, it's great to be here today and to see such a great turnout and uh, see too many people I haven't seen in 11 months, um, the names scrolling by here. So thank you to everybody for coming. We know that uh, we're all ready to get back together again. And uh, conversations like this are what we need to we, where we need to start. We need to start thinking about the future and, and getting ready. And so uh, over the last 11 months, there's been lots of conversations, uh, including ones led by the chamber about what do the future of event, what does the future of events look like? How do we get ready for this? And what do we need to do to be prepared? And so this is a continuation of that conversation. And uh, as Raj said, with the increase in vaccinations and, and the hope for the future, uh, we look forward to that. I was speaking with a colleague in the UK this week and said, you know, you've talked about June 21st or Boris Johnson has talked about June 21st reopening the UK. We're not quite ready to make that commitment here in Canada yet, but I think that still gives us something to look forward to. 
And so I know that our team here at Strauss, we're looking towards the future and we're very actively looking at what does September look like and beyond. And, and so I, I say to our clients and our friends, maybe we're crazy, but we are actively planning in-person events uh, across Canada for this September and October. And we'll make decisions by the end of April whether those can proceed. So today's conversation is about how to get ready for those. What do things have to look like for us to do that? And so I'm excited to have two, uh, two guests with us today for this conversation and to share their expertise and, and where their thinking is at. Lynn Skrmita, uh, most of you will know, is the executive director of the Winnipeg Folk Fest and uh, truly one of the most knowledgeable people on the live event industry here in Manitoba. So Lynn, thank you very much for being here. And Bill Grusich is somebody who most of you won't know in Manitoba. Bill Grusich and I have gotten to know each other through the association management community across North America and globally. And Bill is a senior vice president with Associated, Associated Luxury Hotels, which means that if Bill recommends a hotel to you, it is a top tier hotel. Uh, Bill and his team really represent the best hotels and the best independent hotels across, uh, the Nor across North America and the world with a real focus in the US. And, and I wanted Bill to join us today for two reasons. Bill's a great guy and, and his favorite hockey player was born in Winnipeg and Jonathan Taves. And we all hope that Jonathan Taves will be back on the ice soon. So Bill, um, you know, that's one of the reasons we invite you. But the other reason was um, like everybody here, I follow uh, a number of thought leaders to help me do my job and to help with the work that I do with our clients. And Bill and his team uh, have really done a great job at, I would say, experimenting trial and erroring what can be done to bring people safely together. The US is ahead of us in terms of bringing people back together in person. And we'll leave the political discussions for another time. But for today, we can learn a lot from what the team at Al High and their partner hotels have done to bring people back together. So Bill, thank you so much for, for joining us. I'm sorry this is your, your first trip to Winnipeg in this fashion. Uh, we'll get you here in a different way soon, as soon as we're allowed to. Um, but Bill, can you share with us You've been doing customer events over the last number of months. What's worked? What have you tried? What, what didn't work? Maybe that's actually the, the better question is what didn't work, but share with us where your successes have been in bringing people together in person. Well, Jonathan, number one, it's great to be with you and Lynn today. So thank you for the invitation. I don't know the jersey that's hanging in the back, but I guess you're trying to send me a reminder that uh, the Blackhawks best days might, might not be here today. But, um, you know, just to answer your question, um, you know, I think, you know, in a nutshell, and, and we hear it and I hear it resonate a lot lately more than ever. People miss seeing each other. They want to get together again face to face. I mean, that piece of it, I think it's something we've all taken for granted. But, you know, to to be, you know, to answer your earlier question, we started doing some events probably June, July. We do a traditional thing called executive women in leadership. And it's not us out there saying Hey, you got to get out there and meet and do this and that. It's just there's a way to do it. You know, you can be safe, you can be smart, you can be confident. And I think you touched on it, and so did Raj. I mean, we have noticed um, since vaccines are getting, you know, more widely distributed here, the confidence level has picked up, and people are, you know, starting to move forward. And you and I talked a little bit on a call recently that. You know, we need to get past the election in this country, number one, and number two, to get vaccines moving. And we noticed toward the end of the year, face-to-face -face board meetings, first quarter, second quarter. It's interesting what you just said about what your goal is, because we're seeing the major meetings staying in place from June through the end of the year. You know, what has worked well for us? Um, you know, I will say the, the protocols that hotels have installed in, in the airline industry here, better than ever. I mean, you know, some of the challenges you've got have been staffing in some properties because when things first started to change in March, sadly, a lot of people were furloughed, let go. Hotels were opening and closing. And, you know, one of the challenges still is today what the positive, what the positivity rate is in each community and the impact it's got, you know, in trying to plan ahead. But, you know, communication, you know, it, it's the age old world. I mean, the word, it hasn't changed and it's more important than it's ever been in that, you know, truthfully, when somebody calls and says, look, we're trying to move ahead, we want to move ahead. Those are the words you want to hear when you're on the hotel side, the convention bureau side, whatever. And, you know, you got to work through this. And, um, you know, so that's there. And, and some things that have worked well before our events, we've done, I mentioned nine, and they've varied numbers from 
uh, 50 to 60 to 500 people in four different locations with another 1500 virtually at the same time, which we did in November. And, you know, I think that is one of the challenges that a lot of people we work with in the planning, you know, the, the, the combination of a virtual, the, the hybrid and face to face, I think it's going to be here for a while and maybe for a long time. Uh, you, you're involved in ASAE and they normally have 5,000 people in person. They had 11,000. So I think when you can touch those kinds of numbers, that's not going to go away. And I, and I think the, the pressure it's put on people that execute the logistics, now you become a producer on the side. You're running two, two different experiences for your attendees, and yet you got to tie it all together because at the end, of the end of the day, the name of the game is how many people can you touch. Um, but I think one of the real keys when we've done events is typically 30 days ahead, we will get everybody, the attendees online with the hotel, sometimes the airline partner, we use Delta on the first one and this didn't tout Delta at all, but they have been, you know, far more, I think, aggressive and in, in, in the safety protocols and some of the other airlines here, they still keep the middle seat open their, you know, their videos. And anyway, they were great educating everybody in the safety features. I think the airline travel is at least here probably better than it's ever been. The biggest challenge you go through airports, so many of the restaurants are closed, but the airline experience itself is really better than it's ever been. Hotels, the check-ins, the plexiglass, you know, you don't touch as many things. You get temperature checks in a lot of them and you should. And the food and beverage, and I think that was something you're gonna to touch on a little bit later. You know, guests are not touching the silverware, the, the dishes. I mean, it's gonna be waiters and gloves. And, you know, a recent event we did, um, you know, in, instead of an open bar, people, got to a table and our typical tables have been set four to around, you know, to keep the social distancing. And, you know, that's the other thing. The signage in properties is better than it's, you know, it's certainly outstanding. And, and I think we've gotten good at that. But um, I think we just want to show people that, you know, you can do it. You, you just can't jump out there. There are protocols. If you adhere to them, you can do it. You, you can pull it off. And I think people really appreciate the opportunity to see each other more than they've ever ever had uh, you know the the people who get together at these events i think are you know missing each other and and talking through a mask but it's almost like my god i took this for granted it feels so good to see somebody and, and do it so you can but it's really the communication with the property with you know getting whoever's in charge of your meeting with your attendees scheduling a call 30 days ahead walking them through all the the safety features they're going to experience at the property at the event, what coffee breaks look like, you know, I mean, there's not a lot of fancy food. I mean, one of the best, uh, when I was looking through some of the evaluations, we did a program recently where one of the properties did a Caesar salad in a mason jar sealed, and they poured it out on a paper plate. I mean, that's the kind of thing you're seeing in food and beverage probably more than you ever have. So um, I know that was all over the board, but that's in general what we're seeing with, you know, a lot of events. But you know, each time we do it, we get a little bit better, a little bit smarter. But, you know, again, the communication works. It the, the challenge for us, honestly, I mean, last week it was weather. We had an event scheduled in St. Louis, but because of the awful weather that Texas and some other parts of the country, we had to cancel that. We were scheduled it for a couple of weeks from now. But that was weather related. The, you know, the other things is, you know, the, the constant back and forth of, you know, what the positivity rate looks like. But again, the more vaccines that are getting in people, the better the numbers are getting, the more consistent we're seeing a lot of the local communities in what you can and can't do. So I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, that's great, Bill. And it, it's good to hear about, you know, you're, you've, start, you've started with small groups and I guess you'll build on that. So it's, you know, we all talk about wanting to get back together. And I saw a comment in the chat here. Uh, Prithi commented on my team of Solani jersey hanging on the door behind me that's from a live event that came out of an auction at a live event. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking forward to getting back to that. So Lynn, it's a beautiful day in Winnipeg. You've got the sun coming in behind you, as do I, uh, you've been, uh, you've been very active. I know I've run into you out on the river. Um, it, we're, we're looking forward to mm -hmm. summer, uh, lots of live festivals. So as you start to look forward to summer, as we all do, as you think about Folk Fest for this particular summer coming up, probably a fest like you've never had, when you think about it, what do you need to see happen before you can decide to go ahead with Folk Fest in some format? 
Yeah, so it's it's challenging at this point in time, and I think there are lots of events people who are here uh, today who are, are going the exact same thing that we are, and that's just not knowing where things are going to be at. And I think one of the biggest challenges, even above and beyond that, is not knowing what the protocols are going to be once we get to that position, right? So we could very easily have um, no cases for a few weeks, but we would have had to have made a bunch of decisions way before that in order to, to be managing at that time. So it's really, uh, it's really difficult to try and figure all that stuff out. So what we have had to do over the past several months is come up with a variety of different scenarios. We have seven. Uh, currently, and we just started, discussed a brand new one this morning because uh, we just haven't really got a, a good handle on what the summer is going to look like yet. Uh, we are optimistic, though, uh, because we are an outdoor event, we feel like there might be some some. Uh, better flexibility, but we also know what the challenges are around gatherings right now. I mean, it's very hard to think that we can barely have five people together outside right now. How are we supposed to go to five or 10,000 people, right? So, but uh, we are, are trying to work with the authorities. We are trying to work with um, our, our other counterparts in other provinces to see what other provinces are actually doing and allowing. And that's uh, been really helpful as well. It's partial commiseration, I think, but it's also, <laughs> uh, but it's also, but it's that optimism too though, right? And that's something that we have to maintain. We have to, um, to, to think that, we can't have our events the way that they normally are. We, we, we already dealt with that last year and we did stuff online and, and all that kind of stuff. But we have to think entrepreneurially, creatively, innovatively when even doing an in-person event. We, we, we can't necessarily do things the way that we're, we're used to. So how can we work to do something that brings that experience, that brings that, that feeling that people want from a live event but do it in a safe way, because that is the first and foremost thing that we always want to worry about. And that is, we need to communicate to all of our audiences, regardless of what our events are, is that anything that we do is being done safely and within the restrictions of public health. So uh, again, we don't know what that's gonna be like. We're hoping that we can sort of get to the point where uh, there'll be some kind of agreed upon uh, idea of if we're in this kind of scenario, then this will happen and these kind of kinds of things can go forward. Um, uh, Alberta has actually done that. They have uh, created a, a structure whereby if there are so many hospitalizations, then certain things can happen at certain levels. It would be great to see something like that in this province. And so now, I, I mean, again, we have to wait and see what our province actually wants to do with that because we are really quite beholden to them but uh but again it's too soon to tell what the summer is going to look like i wish i had a crystal ball and i would uh, give you all the good news that i could but um but we're not ready to make a decision one way or the other quite yet but we've got lots of different options and i think that's one of the things that's keeping us all going and i think lynn scenario planning is a phrase that uh, if we didn't know it before we've all learned in the last uh in the last year right uh, that real yeah. focus on on what that looks like um it's interesting you both talked about communication to attendees and and i know um lynn the world i work in is a little different than yours but we've always communicated before events you know this is what time things start this is the kind of attire you might mm -hmm. want to wear i mean i've always laughed like it might be cold in the meeting room so we you know that always gets thrown in there um but you know expectations when you arrive those kinds of things but it sounds like our communication is going to is going to change. Like I, I know from my limited experience, I will admit visiting Folk Fest, health and safety I think is at the top of your list, and and it maybe it's even higher than entertainment in some ways. But is, is that going to change for you? Um, uh, no, I think it's just going to go deeper, right? We've always said to people, bring a hat, wear sunscreen, be prepared for all the different kinds of weather conditions that could possibly happen. And, uh, and we, and we still have to remind people of that on an annual basis. Now, this time, what we're going to have to do is look at, um, exp expressing our, our cleaning protocols and, and, and asking people to do things that might be a little bit different than what they're used to doing. But again, communicating that's going to be really important. We're going to have it. Uh, we would have it on our websites so our, our, when people are purchasing tickets throughout social media. We have this little uh, thing we call folk tips and we have push notifications. So there's lots of different kinds of ways that we're going to have to go about doing those things. But you're right. It is going to be different things. It is going to be new things. It, you know, we might be having to ask people to wear masks outside for uh, for an event, you know, which it might feel a little bit weird. But if that's the right thing to do and the safe thing to do, then that's what we're going to have to do. And I think. Our general feeling is that people have been missing these things so much yeah. 
that they're going to be willing to do what it takes to be able to have that experience. Yeah, but I will also say that we've also um, talked about if there are, if it comes to the point where the experience is so eroded that we have to go through so many hoops uh, for people to actually go come to, come to the experience, it might not be worth it, right? So there also is that that is like kind of weighing in the back of our minds. But I think that's a that's a far out consideration, and that we really won't be able to find a number of things that would we would be able to do, and we'd be, be able to communicate that uh, that could happen and allow the event to happen. Somebody just had a, an interesting comment in here, Lynn, in the chat that said you'll you'll be able to tell who went to Folk Fest by the face tan lines uh, from wearing a mask. <laughs> um, yeah. You know. Um, <laughs> I think it's a great comment, and I think that would be an awesome thing to see. Uh, would be tan lines to wearing a mask at Folk Fest. So we're, uh, I think we're all looking forward to those those kinds of things. Um, Lynn, you talked about um, you know bringing concerts into the home, and and Bill, you talked about hybrid events. One of the conversations, Bill, when we get into hybrid events, is that ch that might change contracts. That might change the way we interact with hotels as a buyer. What, what are you seeing uh, with your partners? How are they preparing for hybrid events? How, how is that changing the conversation um, between the, the meeting planners, the customer and your hotel partners? Well, number one, you know, numbers are certainly different. I mean, I, I get calls from friends of mine and we talk about what it's going to look like in 21, 22. And my suggestion right out of the box is take a look at your highest attendance and figure 60, 65 percent in person because we're going to ramp up slowly. Uh, to answer your question, so many hotels now are packaging in the ability to, you know, have your technology providers right there in property attuned to what the, the, the live meeting is going on at the same time. So, you know, I that is going on. And, and again, like we talked about, um, it, it's going to go on probably maybe for a long time. I don't think that's just going to be a, a short period of time. And, you know, I suggest to every planner that I know since last March, hey, you may not love it, but get certified in the digital space, either through PCMA or MPI, make yourself more relevant because you are now doing two different type meetings, two different experiences at the same time trying to tie it all together and that's not going to change or go away and you can bring in outsiders but the more you know about those two skill sets but you know a number of hotel av companies have have come together and and you know they offer that ability but i think you find jonathan most people have their provider already but you know that's a conversation you want to have because when people walk in and say look we are determined to try and do a piece of this face to face you know you want to work with them you know, and I didn't want to jump off the subject, but one of the things I was reading through the feedback and the evaluations of the nine events that we've had, and it's interesting, and I think Lynn touched on it, people even masked up at receptions are so excited to see each other. They complain that the music is too loud. So I can only imagine what that would do to a festival because people are dying to talk and network. So it's kind of a an interesting thing. It sounds like a bunch of old people my age going, ah, the music's too loud. But, you know, that it's interesting, you know, through the nine evaluations of the, the events that we did, that came up a lot. So, you know, moving forward, that's uh, that's something to think about. But um, I, I look, I think we're we're all trying to grow together in the hybrid space. And, and I don't think that's going to go away. And I think to answer your question, most properties have that ability if needed to connect the technology right there on the spot with the provider and somebody that can walk you through how you can do these two things simultaneously and do it well. Great, Bill. And I see in the chat there's some good discussion happening here. People looking for platform recommendations and how do you make those decisions? And and Lynn, one of the things that that I've said to everybody from the beginning is you, you've got to choose the right platform for for your event. And and I look at it in the same way you would choose a venue or you would choose a lighting company. You've got to look at what you need and start with your needs first. So um, I, I imagine you know live live music events have not been the easiest ones to get online, especially with people in multiple places. But you've had some success with some live live events, live virtual events. Yeah, yeah. So we've done a, a few different things over the past uh, couple of months. Um, oh, oh gosh, actually, it's almost a year now, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, when, <laughs> When we uh, when we had to cancel the festival last April, we weren't sure if we were going to do anything at that point. I think we were all suffering, we were grieving for a little while, 
But then we started reaching out to our sponsors and our partners, and, and they were really excited and interested in supporting uh, some kind of event online. So that's how Folk Fest at Home was born. And um, we realized that it would be a combination of trying to get that experience that we're all used to and we're all missing. So we were able to pull some of our main stage footage and get permission to use that. Then we also wanted to try and, and capture some of those artists that we weren't going to get to see otherwise and maybe do it in an interesting way, like see them in, in their, their homes instead of their, them coming to our home. And so we put something together and it, uh, and it was amazing, actually. We did a three-hour event on the Saturday night that would have been the festival at that point in time. We could have outdoor gatherings and people were having viewing parties all over Winnipeg, all over the province. We had people watching from Brazil and Australia. We had almost 75,000 unique views. And that's just on the computer. So we know with all these watching parties, that was actually exponentially larger. Um, but it was really nice and it was a way of reaching new audience and, and, and talking to people in, in new ways and communicating and connecting with people in new ways. Um, but it scratches an itch, right? It's not the same thing as an in-person experience. And everybody knows that, which is why we're excited to get back. But, um, but we did a couple of other things as well. We, had, we worked with the West End Cultural Center and uh, IRCOM, a local um, uh, community service organization, and, and presented some, uh, some content of local artists just for them. Uh, just for uh, uh, their communities, uh, but it was broadcast online through uh, YouTube and, and Facebook. And uh, we did a, actually a nice little show at the uh, rooftop of the art gallery uh, that had 100 people that were socially distanced apart. And that was really lovely, too. We worked with the National Art Center and did a festival style workshop at, that got to see people uh, watching again from across the country and having 10,000 views for, for an hour long performance, which was great. Um, so it's nice to be able to, to do a little bit of that. Again, just kind of scratching a bit of an itch. And we're going to be doing one of the Safe at Home projects. We're going to be announcing it uh, on Monday. We've got uh, some work that we're doing with uh, uh, the Burton Cummings Theatre. So that's also exciting. But again, it's still not the same, right? We still want to see live music. You don't get the same experience by watching a screen. And there's so much screen watching that we've been doing, right? Yeah. You know, so we're all we're we're, we're it, it's been a good substitute while we can't get together. But really, that's where our core business is. That's what we want to be. That's what events are: is getting getting people together and, and having a social element to it. So we're we're all really excited about that. But I think that we have done a great job. I think the the organizations Bill's talking about have done a great job. The hotels, the events, everything, and and, and making some changes and making some some different things. And I think. Like he said, there there will be elements of this that are here to stay for sure. Um, we're actually going to be broadcasting. Uh, we'll still be live streaming if we have an event because we know that there are people who won't be quite comfortable yet to come back uh, out to uh, out to the park. So let's let's let them still be a part of it. But um, that's that's going to be only part of it. Really, we want to get back to live events. Yeah, and we know we know that we all do. Uh, you know, it's it's the one thing, and I, I agree that I think that maybe we don't want to wear masks outside for twelve hours of music at Folk Fest, but I think that we would we'd be willing to do way more than just wear masks if that's what it took to get to get back uh, outside at Folk Fest. So lots of good questions coming here in the chat. It's nice to see uh, people offering some suggestions, doing some problem solving. Um, there's, you know, a question here about how does the industry work together to put pressure on government uh, to release protocols earlier, and I know discussions are happening on that, uh, lots of people doing that. Lynn, one thing you haven't talked about, but it's been in the news in various places, is it, do you see a role for rapid testing? Could that be part of Folk Fest? Do you see that being part of, of in-person events? It's definitely something that we are exploring and we have been exploring for a little while now. There are some private companies that are that are digging into this. Um, I think it could be a, a really good thing for events. I mean, I, there are some things that need to happen at the federal government level for uh, first, and then some things that will need to happen, happen at the provincial government level. Uh, the approval of antigen tests will be key if this is going to happen. Um, PCR tests are the ones that everybody normally gets and, and they are more reliable, but they're, uh, technically more reliable, but uh, they are extremely expensive and um, unaffordable for events or people like us. 
But uh, antigen tests have been improving quite uh, extensively and they're considerably cheaper and many can be actually self-administered. So if we can get to that point, and I know things are changing so incredibly quickly, but if we can get to that point where we can have uh, antigen tests approved, uh, I think they could very easily become a part of the uh, gathering experience, whether it's uh, an event like Folk Fest or something happening at the convention center or uh, maybe even a theater, then I think we, we could be talking about a whole new experience and getting back to gatherings much more quickly. It's certainly going to be a topic I think we're going to follow closely here. Somebody shared some numbers with me that I know, Lynn, you've seen about what today's rapid testing would cost. And I, and I put into my calculator what I thought that would cost something like the Folk Fest. And I think my calculator rounded the digits. Um, it's just such a big, scary number that it's not practical. So it's good to hear that there are some lower cost options that, that are being considered because I know for our clients adding, you know, one number I saw was $42 a delegate. Another was $150 a delegate. Mm -hmm. um, th those numbers don't work, um, yeah. it, you know, it, on any level. So it's, uh, it's something that we have to look at. Bill, I want to I want to change the tone of, of the conversation, change the subject a little bit. One of the things we love about in-person events, uh, whether it's a food truck at Folk Fest or a high-end gala dinner at, at our convention center or one of our hotels here, is great food. Um, and so, food and beverage is going to have to change. Um, at least some food and beverage service. You talked about that. So, what are you seeing? You know, in your testing you've been doing and your events you've done, what innovations are you seeing? And and what do you what do you see that's new that might stick around that you've liked? You know, I wish I could tell you it's it's the fancy white glove things that that we used to see, but it's not. But uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of bento boxes, and again, a lot of prepared kind of basic things right before. But uh, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to to bring up that might help you all that we've learned a, a lesson here that, you know, we talk about meetings and trying to get events and, and conventions back in place. We've not done a great job of explaining that so much of this is education. There's been such a, a big push in the States about getting kids back to school. And they look at meetings and conventions that, you know, it's fluff and they think of the receptions and things like that. And there's so much education that takes place during the day. You know, the challenges for the planners between all of us is what happens at night in the hotel bars. I mean, that's what you have to worry about. But during the day, the protocols, you know, what, what hotels do, what the attendees do, what the planners in charge, um, that seems to run better than it ever has. So, um, you know, but as far as the food and beverage, I mean, we, you, you, like I said earlier, guests are not touching anything. I mean, you're gonna get a couple of things, you know, for breakfast, uh, handed to you by a waiter in a glove behind plexiglass or, you know, it, it's more than likely going to be plated. I mean, the events we've done, there's no open bar anymore. You sit at the table you're assigned to, they bring you a drink order and then nothing is served until everybody's had their drinks. So that has changed kind of the flow of things. But again, that's going to, you know, as we get better and the numbers get better, you know, I expect that will change too. But, um, you know, you're not going to see the fancy, fancy, you know, buffets like you did before. I think that's gone for, for quite a while. And, you know, nobody's going to be touching anything. It's going to be more basic. It's just trying to get people back together again to meet. And, you know, the, the food has not been such a big, big part of it as much as just the appreciation of getting together and learning from each other again and sharing, my God, how have you dealt with this since February, March of 2020? That seems to be what the conversation has been. Well, I want to inject maybe a little hope here because there's people in the chat saying like, I hope we don't live with some of these things forever. Or, you know, that sounds kind of sad. There's a, there's some interesting comments there. And I think we all appreciate that. Um, I, I do some work um, on behalf of one of our clients with a sister association in Australia. And, and as many of you will know, uh, Australia is far ahead of us. Um, Lynn probably has colleagues in Australia that are doing things she's only dreaming of today. And they are getting back to it. And so we have clients who have trade show tours and, and Australia is rolling out trade shows in March and April. Um, and so it's coming. And, and one of the questions I asked my colleague in Australia last week was, are people traveling? Are they local? He said, no, they're flying from Melbourne to Sydney to go to a trade show. Um, so, yes, we are not where Australia is today, but it shows that we can get there. And I think that's that's what's really important is that is that hope there. Um, you know, for us as a company, we're planning events, as I said, in multiple Canadian cities for this fall. And what we're talking about is um, 
are there going to be different capacity limits? You know, a trade show that might have 500 people, are we going to say only 100 on the show floor at a time as opposed to come whenever you want? Um, you know, and will we have to really get strict about saying registration is this time, show up or don't? Like there's going to be this transition, I think, where maybe some of those things we always wanted to do as on the planning side and the production side, we actually might get to do and maybe people will follow some rules, at least for a little while. Um, so there, you know, there are those kinds of things we have to think about going into the fall and beyond is, um, you know, as Lynn said, all these different scenarios and which pieces fit where. Um, and I just, you know, there's a lot of chat here about hybrid events, and I think it's, it's a great discussion to be having and we all need to be planning for that. Because one of the questions now about, about events and in-person attendance is going to be not will people want to go, can they go, or will people also just want to, you know, will they still have the budgets to go? And that's going to be one of the other questions I think coming out of this is, um, you know, how does that look? So, um, you know, there's lots to look forward to, but there's also, you know, there's challenges, there's challenges still ahead. Um, so let's let's keep that sort of conversation going here uh, with everybody because it's it's nice nice to see these these kind of things. Lynn, maybe there are, there are a lot of questions here about platform, and I don't know if this is you or one of your colleagues, but were there any pieces of technology you used for your at home concerts that uh, you had success with? Um, really, we relied really heavily on YouTube and Facebook Live um, for our events because those are easy to access. Uh, people can use them uh, really easily. They're they're really user friendly and that sort of thing. So broadcasting on, onto those platforms has been uh, really successful for us. Um, we are looking at if we uh, go ahead with some live streaming for the festival this fall, uh, looking at something a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, we've looked at Twitch. Um, we're actually looking at a system called Mandolin right now that's being used and uh, quite a bit for uh, big concerts and, and shows like that. That would be a little bit more, um, it pays a little more attention to audio and, and has some higher quality there. So, so that would be something we, we do too. And, um, you know, I, 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 there was a question I saw in the um, feedback going by that um, people are asking about the cannibalization between in person and um, and streaming events, and and I and I think there it'll become two different experiences, right? There are going to be people who want to have that live experience, and there's going to be people who it doesn't matter that much to. So I think that you, you'll see the audience kind of separating that way, and uh, people want to pay to be at something to be able to say they were at live at that experience, right? It's always been like that. How I mean, I think Woodstock probably had about 50 million people at it because everybody said they were there, right? <laughs> so, um, so, so I think that kind of thing is. Going to continue and in fact we might actually be able to expand our audience even further because um people who we have an aging population uh at, at, like people who came to the first uh, festival may not be able to come out to the park anymore and then they would actually be able to continue to experience the festival by watching it online so there are things like that or like i said earlier um brazil australia people who have maybe thought about um, where Winnipeg is or wanted to see a particular band, see it here, and all of a sudden there's a tourism opportunity and they want to actually experience the festival in real life in the future. So I think that some of these things are actually really quite beneficial instead of uh, being more of a cannibalization, it's an, it's an actual expansion. Right, well, that's good. And, and I would just say, you know, for, for us on the more live events side, um, we, we had two events uh, earlier this month where we used a platform called Be Live, B.Live. And, uh, you know, it wasn't expensive and it allowed us to bring people in from across Canada for a live awards ceremony, as an example. And so there are innovations there and um, there are new market opportunities. You know, we have clients who have now had people participate from very remote parts of Canada that from a financial perspective wouldn't have come to these events otherwise. So it's actually been harder, we find, for some of our national clients to get people who would normally drive down the street in Toronto to something to go online for something because they've been so spoiled about, you know, those those opportunities. But it's... Um, it's, it's interesting to see how that evolves. Bill, we, you talked about in food and beverage and, and Lynn sort of talked about some changing things that often have cost implications. Are your clients, your hotel partners, Bill, are they having to absorb all these costs, the extra cleaning staff, the extra wait staff, or is any of that being pushed on to the, the association, the charity, the corporation hosting the event? Where's the balance in, in paying for some of this? Look, you know, not, not too much has changed. I mean, when you look at a typical hotel today, the, the majority of the profit for years has been off of rooms. I mean, between us, it's about 70%. And everybody goes, oh boy, you guys are rolling it in. And then 
you start looking at the labor and the cost of food and beverage, and that's pretty much a break even or just a, maybe a little bit of profit if you do it right. Obviously, if you're doing cocktail receptions, the, the, the profit margins are larger there. But, you know, to to really be blunt, it, it's, it's going to come off your rooms. And the room rate discussion right now is more flexible than it's ever been, although there are some properties feeling good about life or awfully optimistic that, you know, they're starting to change the rates in 22 because they feel like, OK, we've shifted everything from 20 to 21. And, you know, 22 has got to be a better year. But I mean, these are high demand areas. But, you know, one of the things I, I did want to add to what you just said, though, about the, the virtual audience, I was up until recently on the PCMA board. We've typically got four to five thousand people live. But for over a decade, we've had over a thousand people virtually and we would track the virtual attendees and the great majority of them, I think, saw the benefit of the content. And I think where I'm going with that is it will drive more membership or more people to show up at your events, because I think at the end they go, wow, this is really good stuff. I need to be more active, more involved. You know, that's not the case for everybody. Obviously, there's some people that's their only way they can be there. But, um, you know, I think that's something to think about. Yeah, and I, and I think it's important, and, and Bill, I was giving you a chance to say this, but you didn't, so I'll say it anyways. Um, there's a tendency to, to push back on vendors and make our suppliers, our vendors, eat all of these costs along the way. Um, and I think we're going to, as buyers, uh, and I guess, Lynn, you and I are buyers, we're going to have to accept that, that we're going to have to share in those costs. Um, you know, not everything can be absorbed at the supplier level, you know, margins. Um, I think the, the, the hospitality industry was actually having some really good times going into COVID, you know, things were on a real upswing, but that's not the case. And so I'm a big believer. And if we want to have these good supplier partners going forward, we've got to be good partners with them now. And so, um, you know, there's tight dollars and budgets everywhere, but we can't beat up everybody all the time or they simply aren't going to be there for us next time. And so, you know, when you when you look at these expenses and I'm speaking to sort of our audience here, I would just say, be kind, be nice, because there's been a lot of tough times in the hospitality industry. And yes, we're going to need more hand sanitizer than ever before. But I still haven't gotten a clear answer yet. If we say we want hand sanitizer every 50 feet in a convention center, I don't know who's paying for that. Um, you know, and, and, and somebody's paying for it. We know that. So. We're going to have to, you know, as we look at our budgets, I think, and, and Lynn, I'm sure that's part of your scenario planning is there are some line items in your budget that you would never have thought of before, probably. Absolutely. Exactly like, like you're talking about hand sanitizer, extra hand washing stations in general, signage. We were talking about communications earlier, right? We have to continue to remind people of all different kinds of behaviors that we're going to need them to have to do. Uh, barricades, um, rooting, um, even like if we have to spray paint X's on the ground if people are for people to stand socially distanced in line to be waiting for food or something along those lines. You're right. All of those things have costs attached to them. And uh, and we have to figure out how to how yeah, we can and, make that work. Um, I just there's some I, there's some questions coming up here that I think are I want to just address and we'll get back to our, our Q and A here in a second. Um, there's a question about whether following the session some of the there can be some kind of summary or something. So I don't work for the chamber. I'm a member like like Lynn and others and everybody else here. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the chamber staff will have a way when the evaluation goes out that we can somehow capture some of these ideas that are there in the chat in the discussion to share with you. Bill and his team have put together some resources that will go out um, with the evaluation that are links to some of their case studies and some of the things they've, they've tried and, and what they've seen work. So those examples are coming, but there's definitely also, uh, oh, Lauren is saying yes. So Lauren, I'm hoping you're saying yes to my question in the chat here. So there are a lot of platform ideas here. This is a relatively small community. So I know there's lots of people very open to sharing and discussing ideas. A lot of us have been getting together over the last 11 months to talk about this. So certainly I know you can reach out to me and I know Lynn's not hard to find. Um, and we've got great teams, both of us. So, you know, reach out and, you know, we have to continue supporting each other. And um, for those of you that do work outside of, outside of Manitoba and into the United States, you know, I said in the introduction, I was, I might sound like I was joking, but Bill really knows the U.S. hotel market so, so well. And so if you're looking at bringing things into the U.S. Um, and you want to know how to safely do that, Bill and his team are, are really a great resource for that. So reach out to people like Bill. We've got to lean on each other, I think, even more than ever before to make these events successful. Um, you know, as we as we come back to this. So great to see, you know, people are in the chat offering to help each other and, and bring those things back together. 
Lynn, going back to costs, um, I know that that you and 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 uh, in the in the music community, um, negotiating contracts with artists um, is a big thing and takes a lot of time. And if you don't get it right, you can have surprises or, or unexpected costs. When you're talking to artists now, you're you've talked a lot about hybrid and streaming folk fest. When you're talking to artists now, how has that conversation changed when you now throw in, oh, and I want to live stream your concert? How has that changed? Well, I mean, it's part of the negotiations right up front. And, and because we're in this new world all together, it's all happening at the same time. It's actually an easier conversation than it might have been otherwise. Um, artists uh, want uh, work, artists need work. And so it's a way of, of getting themselves out there, of showing that they're still active and viable and, and available and, and entertaining and all of those things, right? So um, it definitely is part of the conversation, which what will be interesting moving forward is, is, to, is once things kind of revert back to a uh, more of a, a standardized uh, system, how that's going to get uh how that's going to be part of it because i think it will have to be part of it because everybody has been changing their business models and and that sort of thing so um right now everybody's sort of agreed to it just in the same sort of way last year when uh we had to cancel um everybody just kind of walked away from all the deals that we had so we got our deposits back and and uh, and that and that sort of thing. So it didn't uh, create a whole bunch of hardship on the organization. Um, but I, I think there'll be new industry standards that evolve out of all of this, and the it, it's just really getting started now. Great. Well, and I know the the month of March and into you know I guess mid March to mid April was that period where um, contract conversations weren't fun because we didn't know how long things were going to last, and um, that's where I think we were all. I say a little bit on edge. We were very on edge. Um, you know, we didn't know what to do. I remember posting on social media, please, let's take this two weeks at a time. Boy, did I look stupid, hey? Uh, but, you know, I think things have changed. We've all learned a lot. I think the word partnership um, was a word we threw around way too easily in the past and it didn't have any teeth to it. I know who my friends are now more than ever, uh, my work friends, especially, you know, where we said, okay, how are we going to solve this? Like, we had one venue that said, if you want all of your deposit back right now, that check might bounce. Um, so we've got to come up with a repayment schedule for a large deposit. You know, so there were there were some very honest conversations start happening. Unfortunately, I think some of them took a little bit too long to happen, but you know that that happened. Bill, you talked about room rates uh, as sort of part of a, a comment. You talked about you know the hot busy markets. You know they're being aggressive and. What do you what do you think is going to happen with with hotel room rates for meetings and conventions, you know, over the next 18 to 24 months? Are we going to see like a post 9-11 fall? Is it a little bit softer? You know, what, what do you see happening already and what do you think is going to happen? Look, it, it's going to be extremely flexible for the next in most parts. In most cases, it's going to be, I think, more flexible than you've seen. I mean, we went through a downturn that, you know, you could add 9-11 uh, and 2008, 9, and 10, and it didn't impact what we've gone through. I mean, 40% of the, you know, the the job losses in our country were in the travel, leisure, and hospitality industry. And I'm sure it's kind of reflective like that up in Canada. So, you know, you talk about what it was like in March and April. The challenge we had more than anything is who are you going to get on the phone on the other end of it? I mean, one property I'm not going to name, the only person working was a general manager, and they didn't understand CVEN. So, you know, those are some of the challenges you go through and then, you know, trying to keep people engaged. And, and that's really been a lot of the philosophy of why we started doing events in the summer, you know, not to say, hey, we get out there and be unsafe and be uncomfortable. But if you want to do this, you can do it. And, you know, the more you do it, the better you get and the more the vaccines get. And, you know, you all kind of talked about it. But, you know, for the most part, room rates are going to be very flexible have worth having conversations with and i think you're going to be pleasantly surprised the challenge is going to be so many groups that have shifted from february march of 20 moving forward um you know the back end of 21 i mean to be real honest we we have seen a lot of small meetings happening since the beginning of the year but again it's a lot of face-to-face -face board meetings which in all the years i've done this no matter what kind of downturn or challenge you've been through it's always been a pretty good indication that things are starting to move ahead a little bit. The big things are digging in and, and trying to meet from September through the end of the year. I mean, we're feeling better about that, but nothing's for sure. But, you know, if you can get the dates, the rates are gonna be, I think, 
flexible, competitive. Um, you know, the, the one the, the one rare example was was a you know a hotel in Florida that is very high end, and they're going well first quarter. This is our rate. We're not you know varying from it. But that is not the conversation we're having with most of our members. Most of them, if they have the space, are going to be very flexible, very competitive. You know, forget any kind of heavy attrition, reasonable. You know, and, and I think you all touched on it. We are talking more to get through a meeting, the communication more than we've ever had, just because of all the, the moving pieces and factors and everything, the the ups and the downs and the positivity rate and the impact it's got, labor, you know, what's going on. So um, you can drive a rate in most places. I, I would say for certainly 21, if the space is there, and even part of 22. But 22 will be the year that hotel owners and operators feel like, okay, we really got to get back in business. Otherwise, we're going to be shutting the doors for good. So, And we've seen that flexibility. And I, and I think you know we, we should commend the hotel industry and the convention centers and other supplier partners who have, um, you know, uh, the debt level, I'm sure, is extremely high at some of these places now. Um, but we've seen so much flexibility and contract clauses that would have seemed unheard of um, are now are now somewhat common at least you know for what we're seeing for the rest of this calendar year at least lynn there's a number of questions here about sponsorship and sponsorship for virtual events or hybrid events did you have sponsors for some of your at-home events and and if you did can you talk about how some of that worked yeah, so when we did our uh, Winnipeg Folk Fest at home last summer, uh, the only reason why we did it is because we had sponsor involvement and sponsor feedback. Um, you know, we, we made our, our first calls to our biggest sponsors, our biggest partners who've been uh, with us for uh, for several years, and that included Assiniboine Credit Union and Bell MTS and, and Big Rock Brewery. And we said, listen, um, can't have an event this year, but we want to do something, and we're thinking of doing something online. Would you be willing to support? And they all came back and said, absolutely. Now, some of them couldn't support at the same level as they would support the regular event, which we could understand, but, uh, but they did feel it was really important that we continue on and we continue to do our business. And so they worked with us. We had to provide some different benefits. We had to look at, at doing things differently, um, but we, we ended up having a little ACU commercial and a little Bell MTS commercial during our, our Folk Fest at home. And, they, and, and both of those organizations in particular uh, took a lot of thought in, in, in terms of what our audience was all about what we were hoping to communicate um, and what they wanted to communicate to our specific audience. So uh, it wasn't something that, that was jarring and, and very corporate, but actually really worked in conjunction with what we were doing. So I thought that was great. It was a, a, a really good way of redefining how we work together and, uh, and it ended up having really positive results. Uh, we had a couple of our, our, our other sponsors who, um, who ne couldn't necessarily step up as well, just say, listen, we just want to be a part of it. We just want you guys to still be around. We want you to do something for this community. And so, so they were a little more behind the scenes, but still really supportive. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, we're, as we're kind of figuring out what happens for this year, um, I can't, I, I don't know where all our, our sponsors are are at exactly quite yet. We're just starting to get into those conversations, but I think that they're part of what sponsorship is, is, is community support. And I think we will continue to see that. Well, I'm glad to hear that our, our community uh, of sponsors was continuing to support Folk Fest. I'm not surprised. Um, you know, you have such a strong brand and such a strong place in our community here. And, you know, there were a lot of conversations about platform and platform uh, for a lot of virtual events drives how your sponsorship program looks. So I know Hopin, as an example, the chamber's been able to integrate sponsors and other things and platforms like Feedloop and, and a number of the platforms have ways to integrate and bring in sponsors and advertisers. So um, we are out of time. So um, Lynn and Bill, thank you so much for all of your expertise and experience here. Uh, this has been great. Uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, I know from the questions, lots has been learned. There's been good experience sharing amongst us and amongst uh, everybody in the audience. Um, it's been very interactive. So I appreciate that. Bill, we will get you up here, maybe one August to Folk Fest. Um, Lynn, would, love it. would absolutely love it. And, and uh, Lynn, Bill, Bill has a history with Fairmont going back a number of years, and I know that's one of your partners. So um, yeah. it would be great to see you up here, Bill. And Lynn, thank you both so much for being here, being part of this. Um, Raj, I want to thank uh, the Chamber for its leadership in, in putting together events like this. Lauren and his team and the board have done such a great job of bringing community together over the last 
11 months. I mean, you always do it. That's the role of the chamber. But uh, as a small business owner, a longtime member of the chamber, Raj, I just want to thank you and, and the board and the staff of the chamber for all you've done uh, really above and beyond for us over the last uh, 11 months. So thank you. And Raj, I'll hand it back over to you. Great. Thank you so much. And wow, what an amazing conversation. Well, that is all the time we have for today's fireside chat. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lynn and Bill. And thank you for leading the conversation, Jonathan. Thank you for bringing us to, to us a sense of optimism. We are all looking forward to gathering again when it's safe to do so. Before we conclude today's event, I want to remind you of two upcoming events coming up. Mayor Brian Bowman returns for another State of the City address on Friday, March 19th to give a progress report on Winnipeg. Register for the virtual event today at winnipeg-chamber.com. For over a decade, the Winnipeg Chamber has been highlighting the most innovative, creative, and community building companies in Winnipeg through its Spirit of Winnipeg Awards. Spirit Awards application deadline is coming up fast, but there's still time to apply or nominate someone in the Winnipeg business community. This year's event will be held virtually on May 27th. Applications close on March 4th, so be sure to visit our website at winnipeg-chamber.com to apply, nominate someone, or to learn more. That concludes today's program. Thank you all for coming out today, and thank you again for our wonderful panel for today's conversation. Have a great rest of your day and stay safe.